Rising from the rubble of the Civil War emerged a group in the South whose ultimate goal was a counter-revolution, their reaction to losing to the North. They called themselves the Ku Klux Klan, led by former white Confederate officers and soldiers, the KKK grew quickly, brutalizing former slaves and sympathetic whites all across the war-torn South. You describe it as the, organ the first organized terrorist movement in American history. The white reactionaries who formed the Ku Klux Klan and attempted to overthrow Reconstruction were proud of being white supremacists. They used the, the term. And, and similarly, people who were victims of the Klan or observing the Klan did use the word terror and terrorism. In his latest book, Klan War, Ulysses S. Grant and the Battle to Save Reconstruction, historian and author Fergus Bordovic sets the record straight about two-term President Grant and his efforts to use the federal government to suppress the Klan. He was a victim of the lost cause ideology which prevailed for that hundred years. And if you look at Grant through the lens of civil rights, human rights, you see a heroic figure, not a failure. The author of eight previous nonfiction books, Bordovic uses vivid accounts in Clan War to tell a compelling narrative that are reminders of today's challenges to protect the ballot box and quell intimidation. What I've tried to do in this book and other writers have also been trying to do uh, is to go back to what Reconstruction really was, what was really at stake. Fergus Bordewick, welcome to St. Louis. Thank you, Victoria. I'm thrilled to be here. Well, I'm just wondering, are you aware that just a few miles away is our old courthouse where the Dred Scott case, the, the original case, was heard before it went to the Supreme Court? I am indeed aware of it, a place we all ought to know about. They were, you know, ahead of their time in terms of suing for their freedom, but it didn't really help them. The Supreme Court, one of the worst decisions made was probably that decision to not grant them that. For sure. Today, nobody would disagree with you. Right. And then Grant's Farm, that's another one that's become kind of a family attraction where uh, Ulysses S. Grant owned some land that originally was owned by his in-laws, the Dents. Yes, indeed. So there's a lot of Missouri in this book. So I, I learned a lot from the book and this ugly chapter in American history. What was missing from other history books that you felt you needed to write Clan War? The whole period of Reconstruction from approximately 1865 to 1876 uh, has been wildly misunderstood for almost 100 years, give or take. Reconstruction in its own time was an ambitious, forward-looking, in today's terms you would say, progressive uh, attempt to refound the United States on a basis of fairness and equality. Think of the post-war amendments, 13th, 14th, 15th amendments, and so on, to transform the economy of the South away from a slave-based aristocratic economy into one more based on industry and small farming, like the North, and so on. This is very forward-looking. Right. And to include black Americans, four million freed people, in that refounded America, that truth of Reconstruction was, dare I say, revised, reinvented by the lost cause defenders of the Confederacy and the Confederate mm -hmm. cause who ultimately prevailed over Reconstruction, and then for uh, about 100 years, influenced the entire country in, in coming to think of Reconstruction as a catastrophe, a failure, just a mismanaged, bloody business uh, run by uh, corrupt individuals, black and white. And anybody who was educated before the last 20, 30 years more or less absorbed that. Mm -hmm. And what I've tried to do in this book, and other writers have also been trying to do, is to go back to what Reconstruction really was, what was really at stake. I guess a victim of that misinformation is Ulysses S. Grant. Ron Chernow wrote a book, and I know you've talked about him before, uh, about Ulysses S. Grant, as you do too, but he tries to really dispel all these misnomers that he was a drunkard and an ineffective leader. This really does dispel that myth. And, you know, it's sad that we were kind of taught that in history because it was in during his two terms that he, I guess, fell victim to this mischaracterization. Yeah, you're exactly right. He was a 
victim of the lost cause ideology which prevailed for that hundred years. And if you look at Grant through the lens of civil rights, human rights, you see a heroic figure, yeah. not a failure. No, and, and he, he was an interesting guy. Well, what I found interesting is, because again, we have the St. Louis connection here. Yeah. Uh, when he took over the land, because the Dent family, was his yeah. wife was a Dent, prominent family, they owned this land down, which is now, I guess that's South City, South County, where Grant's farm is. And there were slave homes, cabins, whatever, yeah. on the property. He had them taken out. But he owned slaves at one time. So then you see this, and it wasn't like overnight, gee, I had this aha moment, I'm against slavery. You talk about his thinking and his process that changed his mind. That was fascinating. Sure. I mean, to be, to be fair to Grant, he was never pro-slavery no. in his entire life. Right. His father was an abolitionist. Right. Grant was, before the Civil War, and essentially a political man. He didn't have much in the way of politics. And he only owned, and very briefly, thanks to the debts, which embarrassed him no end, yeah. only one slave in his own name. He was not happy about it. And he freed that man uh, in about a year, after about a year. He couldn't afford to relinquish his labor initially, I, but he didn't, he didn't sell him. Yeah. He could have sold the man, but he didn't. He gave him his freedom even when he was on having hard times and could have used the money, sure. but he wouldn't sell a right. human being. Right. And he, the war radicalized right. Grant. He was an honest guy. He really was. I have great uh, admiration. And it sounds like historians like yourself have, are setting the record straight, which is wonderful. We should all educate ourselves. This is really a must read for higher education too. They, I hope that happens. Well, I hope so too. I know we really need to change this mindset because a lot of it, definitely the, the Reconstruction Act, and we'll get into that in a moment, is relevant today. But let's go to the KKK. Um, you describe it as the, organ, the first organized terrorist movement in American history. How come it wasn't called that back in the 1870s? Well, it was. They used in that fact, word? The word terrorism yeah. was used. Okay. I, I didn't coin any new terms here. And you'll also encounter the word white supremacy yes. in this book. Yes. You know, not because it's a term that we use at the moment. It was what was used then. And the white reactionaries who formed the Ku Klux Klan and attempted to overthrow Reconstruction were proud of being white supremacists. They used the term. And similarly, people who were victims of the Klan or observing the Klan did use the word terror and terrorism. And it was, when what you described me, very yep. detailed. Yep. And I would talk about your research in that because it's, uh, I know a lot of it has to be coming from what's in these archives because your bibliography is pretty thick. <laughs> so good research. But right away, before you even have, go to your preface, um, you define what a Republican is back in the 1870s, as well as white supremacy, the word terrorist, and how calling black Americans black was less accepted then as it is today. Why was it important to establish these differences? Because the language has changed in 150 years. And with respect to the political parties, well, they've kind of flipped uh, compared to the, the, the postures they had back in the 1860s and 70s. The Republican Party of the time was the more uh, progressive, dare I say, or I prefer the word forward-looking yes. uh, for the time. It also supported a stronger central government. The Democratic Party, especially the Southern wing, wing was absolutely embedded in the world of slavery. It was reactionary. It was not forward-looking. It still was tenaciously uh, demanding uh, or claiming that states had rights paramount to the rights of the federal government and so on, and more resembles a certain wing of today's Republican Party right. in that the Republican Party of a century and a half ago more resembles generally uh, the Democratic Party. So you have to have this framework yes. uh, in order to understand yeah, what's going on. My, just as a, you know, yeah. a contemporary of living in these times, yeah. I had to wrap my brain around it because yeah. the Democrat and the KKK were one and the same. In the South. The, in the South, yeah. Yeah, the, the KKK <laughs> was the, was the uh, armed wing of the Democratic yeah, Party. Yeah. So um, let's set the stage for our viewers. The Civil War, War has been over for a couple of years. Uh, it's the 1870s. I mentioned, yes, the North won. Slaves became free men. But to many of these Republicans, these progressives who are abolitionists, uh, naively believe this illusion that the war settled all the issues. Okay, everything's great now between the North and the South. But the South are saying, no, we have lost our power, and power meant control over their slaves. Um, describe what was happening in Pulaski, Tennessee, at that time just south of Nashville. A, a, a group of um, kind of 
depressed and bored young Confederate veterans, all of them well-educated, by the way, were looking for a way to entertain themselves and their friends, and they came up with uh, creating this wacky, and it was wacky, yes. fraternity, which they called the Ku Klux Klan. That name, too, because you described yeah. that. It's fascinating. It's, and stemmed from these guys. They were a guitar and fiddle group, so I'm like reading that again, huh? And yeah. so the evolution is odd. Yeah, it is odd. I mean, they dressed up in these wacky costumes yeah. and so on and would pop up around town, yeah, yeah playing their banjos yes, and whatnot. Yes, So it was kind of a frivolous it was. quality. It was, but except for one aspect. One of the things they did to entertain their word themselves was to scare black people, and freed people. The South is kind of in chaos. Law and order is very doubtful everywhere. And uh, whites, of course, were accustomed to doing whatever they wanted uh, at, toward, around blacks. And they did. And these are free, free, free black? people yeah. now. But this was not violence at right. the beginning. Right. It was, it was unkind. Right. It was unkind, it was a bit menacing, but what happened was very rapidly, this organization, this more or less harmless or not too harmful organization, was taken over and revamped by former senior Confederate officers meeting in Nashville. And they saw its potential as a terrorist organization, mm. and it was founded with that intention. It wasn't founded to defend white womanhood or anything mm -hmm. of this sort. It was founded as, as a tool, a weapon, to try to scare freed people into, back into submission, right. to, to uh, destroy the embryonic two-party system in the South, brand new, frail Republican Party, it's biracial, right. which, which just right. drives right. white Democrats up the walls. Right. And it is a, going to transform the South. And the Democrats, reactionary Democrats absolutely will stop at nothing to prevent that from happening. So its goal from very early was political, and one of its strategies was to terrify blacks out of politics, and white Republicans also, by the way. Many, many right. whites were sure. also oh, killed yes. And, yes. and abused. So their ultimate goal is this counter-revolution in reaction to losing the war, and, and I guess, and keeping, because yeah. now you've got, well, of course the Republicans are voting, keeping the blacks away from the ballot box. Yeah. Yes, so you see a yes. lot of that, too. So let's go back to President Grant. He's in office. He's getting these letters from former slaves. Um, and I want, how did you get the, hold of those? Because you, 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 you quote them. Is this all in, our, in these libraries? There uh, is an abundance, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of letters written by formerly enslaved people, sometimes writing very painstakingly in newly learned uh, English. You can uh, see the broke, you know, you can yes. like, almost phonetically yep. writing out the words. And, and, but often people who had educated <clears throat> yes. themselves very well, there's quite a wide range. Right. Uh, but they're writing directly to the president, which Americans generally right. did in those days. You'd never yeah. get a response right. today, yeah. but in those days, people did it at, very commonly. But thousands are writing to Grant, and these are all in his collected papers. You share those letters from them, from the white Republicans. Yeah. particularly from North and South Carolina that was yeah. brutalized. Uh, local and state officials were at risk. So they're all saying, help us, please help us. So now this is the first time we've got people in states turning to the federal government yeah. saying, right. please save us because right. we're dying here. We're yeah. getting lynched and, be that, and that's the kindest death. Some of these were horrible tortures from what you described. Horrible, horrible. horrible. I mean, yeah. it, it, it's Unspeakable, not, I don't even want to share it. No, on, no, on we, the, won't, we won't no. even talk about it here. <clears throat> Suffice it to say, yeah. just about anything that you can, cruel that you can imagine people doing to other human beings, the Klan perpetrated, generally on, on black yes. free people, but yes. also sometimes on white yeah, people. Yeah, especially if you're uh, you white and had influence and were <clears throat> sympathetic to the cause of, yeah. of freedom for yeah. slaves. You would think in Washington, <clears throat> for granted, it would be a slam dunk to convince Congress uh, that that we should do this, we should come and help them. But he had a little bit of a battle in Washington. He did. Well, bear in mind right. also that the Klan developed in 1866 and it became kind of turbocharged right. by 1867, 68. Grant isn't elected until the end of 68, becomes president in 69, and he's learning how to be president too. Right. The country he's considered an outsider. Yes, yeah. he was. He was yeah. an outsider, a uh, non-politician. Right. He really had to kind of learn the job. Right also, and hit many, many things to learn. And 
uh, the Klan had run rampant now for a few years. Why, how, how could that happen? Okay, there's this notion that, well, wasn't the South under military occupation? Because the Lost Causers always said it was. Well, it wasn't. At the end of the Civil War, there were a million federal troops in the South, that's July of 1865. By 1868, there were only 12,000, which is nothing, mm -hmm. spread over 11 mm -hmm. states, mostly concentrated in cities. Uh, two, the federal government did not, at that point, have the authority to step in and, and suppress the Klan because there was still a tension between what we call states' rights and, and federal power And a lot of former Confederates or their sympathizers are already back in power right. in the southern right. states, and states are not enforcing even reasonable state laws against the Klan's crime. Well, why would that be? It's because the Klan has so infiltrated already yeah. Yeah. government, the courts, sheriff's offices, yeah. the constabulary, juries won't convict. They're, right. convict. they're terrified. It was, it was just running yeah. amok. There was no yeah. law and order no. for no. For uh, uh, blacks <clears throat> or for the white Republicans, That's really. Right. Uh, boy, yeah. Oof, yeah. I was thinking, boy, what a horrible time to be down. And everybody's got a gun. And everybody's got a gun. And after four years of war, yeah. there are guns all over Everywhere. the place. Yeah. There's a part of me that wanted to see uh, them rally, and they kind of do later on, I mean, the white Republicans, but eh, it's a little uh, later on down the road. Uh, well, but, but you're touching on something really interesting there. Um, There were Republican governors in a number of these yes, states. Yes, there were, yes. And theoretically, they could raise militia. Right. But the people who would join a militia were, were the same guys who were joining the Klan. And that's where, was it North Carolina Governor William Holden goes yes, running to Washington right. because they're ready to put, impeach him yeah. because they're all yeah. KKK, right. real, basically politicians, and he's not. And so he runs to Washington. You got to help us down here. So yeah. he's up there, plus yeah. all the letters he's getting. Yeah. I think when he went, he was able to convince it, others outside Grant. And then yeah. he goes back and doesn't. he gets impeached. So th there's these cries for help. So then you now have what we talked about earlier, the, rev the progressive idea of this uh, Reconstruction Acts. So explain to us in simple terms what, what that did and why it was progressive. We could be here for three weeks discussing this, <laughs> but we'll, I'll, I'm going to abbreviate things here. But the, the, the um, new legislation that went into effect during Reconstruction temporarily barred a lot of the old aristocracy, the wealthy landowners who had run everything right. before the war, had barred them from public office, which created space for new people to come in. And bear in mind, not only were Uh, all blacks disenfranchised in every sense uh, before the Civil War, but so were poor whites because the southern states, for the most part, no, m mostly were oligarchies that were controlled by a very small, rich elite, which, which was sitting on everybody's backs. Right. Okay, so you had new people, they're all men, so I'm going to say new men, yeah. uh, coming up, both black and white, and immensely talented uh, uh, black people who were leaders in their communities. And, and, a, threat, now, and a threat to these land, landowners. Yeah, naturally, <laughs> yeah. naturally kind of rose, rose to the top, uh, ran for local offices mm -hmm. because it became possible for blacks to vote in most states before the 15th Amendment made it a national mm -hmm. law. That's not widely known. Right. So in 1868, 69, There are talented black people being elected to office right. as well as white Republicans locally. And former slaves, as a result of the uh, 14th Amendment, the Watershed Amendment, one of the right. great amendments in our history, uh, bestows all the rights of citizenship ship explicitly on everyone, regardless of color. So people can, per men can participate in public life, and so on. They uh, can sue in court. Black people couldn't right, sue in a court, right, right. except right. under special circumstances sure. before the war, and so on. All the Which rights that- Dred Scott ended up yeah, doing. All the rights that we're accustomed to <clears throat> right. became available to black Americans. And one of the most impressive things in, in researching this whole subject is, is how dynamic black communities were in seeking education. Men, women, children, old men, a young man filling schools and becoming literate as fast as they possibly can. And the Klan would target those schools they and did. burn them down. Burned them. Torture burn the them. teacher. Ugh. 
But the other thing it did, though, was um, allowed Grant to send troops in. Yep. Uh, especially to South Carolina. In fact, he had them on um, martial law. He declared martial law, right? Uh, well, uh, finally, what happened was this. Congress, because you have to, Congress is behind Grant, basically. Right. Although Grant goes, he walks up to Capitol Hill. Well, he rides his carriage yes, to Capitol yes, Hill, yes. and then he walks in, into the Capitol. Yeah, that's a great part of it. And, and he, he, he makes it clear personally, he's yeah. putting his prestige on the line, yeah. I need law that is going to enable me to break the Klan. Yeah. And now he has supporters in Congress. Uh, these are the, they were called the radical Republicans. Right. Radical then just meant they believed in, in civil rights. Yes. It yeah. didn't really mean yeah. anything. Right. They often were businessmen who had a business orientation. Yeah. But on, and when it came to rights, they were very, very forward-looking. Right. And Grant begs for and demands legislation. He gets it. It's called a Force Act, or sometimes the Ku Klux Klan Act. Right. And it enables him to do uh, a couple of things. One, in counties... Uh, that are in a state of insurrection, key word yeah. that's used throughout these yeah. acts, uh, allows him to uh, uh, suspend habeas corpus. That means to hold people and to use the military to do it if necessary. Now, to keep it in perspective, he only did that in nine counties right. in, the, in South okay. Carolina, but there was a reason for that. It was just a, an intense hotbed of violent mm -hmm. Klan activity, maybe 60 to 70 percent of white men in these several counties were members of the Klan, mm -hmm. and a lot of the rest were sympathizers. Right. It's in the hands of the Klan. Okay, so he's got the law now behind him. The law is very specific, targeting or barring, uh, wearing costumes, right. threatening people, threatening public officials. The uh, penalties are higher if you're right. caught wearing a costume at night than a day, and there are a whole lot of very specific parts of this legislation that make it clear that the goal is the Ku Klux Klan. And he, had, and he was able to back that up with people who, who would go to the end to make sure that that happened, and he, follow through. Yes. The people he musters for this campaign, uh, and South Carolina is meant to be a, the test case. Right. If we can break them there, we can break them anywhere. And he's correct in his analysis. And he has, on one hand, this two-fisted uh, attorney general, Amos Ackerman. Yes. You look at a picture of him, he doesn't look like a two-fisted no, kind no. of guy. Very, very small. And you and, do share some photos in the yeah, book. Yeah, but who is a very tough attorney general who sends prosecutors in. He backs them up with the Department of Justice. He personally goes down to South Carolina to oversee prosecutions. So that's one hand. On the other hand, he sends the 7th Cavalry. Right. Now, a lot of people associate the 7th Cavalry perhaps with George Armstrong Custer. Yeah. They'd be correct mm -hmm. because that's the cavalry unit that gets massacred or dies, let's right. say, uh, at the Little Bighorn. Some of these are the same troopers, uh, not Custer. Right. Custer didn't want any right. part of this. Right. Instead, uh, the 7th Cavalry is commanded by a wonderful guy who's got a Missouri connection, Lewis Merrill, a major yeah. Yeah. who was an, a rare abolitionist in the yeah. officer corps who spent the Civil War hunting uh, Confederate guerrillas in Missouri. And he was very well known in Missouri. He had a unit of cavalry called Merrill's Horse. Uh, poetry was written to it. It's in the book. Yeah. Uh, and he was a remarkable guy. He was also a lawyer, very well educated, and totally committed to breaking the Klan. And he, he uh, uh, infiltrated the Klan with spies, both white and black. And, okay, you might say black, black spies in the Ku Klux Klan, very important. Most of his information came from blacks. Right. Uh, because half of the population in those counties right. is black. Right. White Klansmen, who are often landowners, more affluent people, they don't imagine that uh, black people are smart enough to know what they're talking about. So they're discussing Klan activity right in front of them. This is all com coming back to Merrill. So on one hand, representing Grant, he's got the goods on the Klan. Prosecutions start. Up, he arrests uh, about 1,000 people, right. about 1,000 wow. in a few counties. Yeah. Uh, some of them uh, just come in and surrender right. because they know he, he's going to get them. And it tells you one thing, and I'll, <laughs> I'll well, give you another chance, me, yeah. that uh, <laughs> The Klan were oh they were they were they were they were tough and 
but they were big guys when they were when they were murdering or torturing unarmed, helpless, often isolated men, women, and children. And masked and, up. And, um, and, and in and, masks yeah. <clears throat> and so on. They were tough guys. Mm -hmm. But faced with the Seventh Cavalry, they just caved. Mm -hmm. They were cowards. Mm -hmm. Of course they were cowards. They were bullies. I'm going to go to your writing. How long did it take to write that? Well, the actual writing is about two to three years, uh, which, believe it or not, for writing a book is kind of fast. But, uh, but I've yeah, been thinking. Because your bi bibliography is about this thick. Yeah. Two, so you, you have to say, here's where I've got my information. I've been reading and thinking about, about this for a long time. I mean, years, actually. I, I wanted to write about Reconstruction. And I wanted to write about uh, what the radicals in Congress did after the Civil War. I wrote about them at length in my last book, which is called Congress at War. And it's how Congress fought the Civil War. It's a great story. But I was thinking about the same people. And then I, was, I did, I did uh, uh, civil rights work, voter re registration in the South quite a while ago. I, I had a full head of hair. <laughs> and uh, I, I had some encounters with the Klan. That's the modern Klan right. of the Which 20th is a whole century. other thing. It's another thing. Yes, that, that was, again, opened my eyes in your book to that. Yeah. I, I just, I'm thinking back, what was I taught in school? Wow, I think everything I've learned is through movies and, and maybe a few yeah. articles here. Sadly, but it's, so it's a little distorted to say the least. Well, but they're two different th factions, and so you'll learn this in the book, folks. You need to pick this up. Real quickly, also, you've written, you mentioned other books. Uh, you've written about a half dozen historical books, books about American history. What helped shape your desire to write about American history? Uh, I could answer that a lot of different ways, okay. but, you know, uh, I, I, I was raised in New York State, okay? Uh, my, my grandmother uh, was born in 1882. This is a little bit before television, yeah. you know, uh -oh. and uh, my grandmother would, would try to keep me keep me entertained or engaged in the afternoons, and she would tell me the Civil War stories of of her father and her father's friends, and she had all these stories, and uh, from from that early, I had this this fascination with history and specifically the Civil War era, and and um, her memory was close enough. To it that it was very real to me and I also had the good fortune my parents are very history uh, minded and I was taken to Gettysburg in 1957 first time I've been there many times since then and as for many people who visit Gettysburg it's a very intense place and uh, the landscape still seems to possess in itself yes. something of that time I was a journalist for many years but I, I found myself essentially writing history, even as a journalist. Right. So it's, it's always been there. Yep. Fascinating. It's a great read. Uh, folks, if you're, whether you're a Civil War buff or not, it doesn't, well, if you are, you should know this history, but who knows. Uh, learn it. This is great. Thank you for your work. Clan War, Ulysses S. Grant, and the Battle to Save Reconstruction, Fergus Borderworth. Thank you so much for coming to St. Louis, and uh, thank you again for writing the book. Thank you, Victoria. It's been a great pleasure talking to you.